they have given us a slight, a small table, I believe. Oh, here we go. There's actually a nice little graph here in the book. And a little bit of discussion here about elastic versus inelastic. So I can get that lined up just right. There we go. And you'll notice in the discussion here in the book, um, classical theory of impact, E equals 1 means that the capacity of two particles to recover equals their tendency to deform. This condition is one, one, uh, this condition is one of elastic impact with no energy loss. The value E equals 0, on the other hand, describes inelastic or plastic, and actually they should say perfectly plastic because plastic deformation implies that there's some permanent set. Some permanent set. But a perfectly plastic, if E was zero, it would be perfectly plastic impact where the particles cling together after collision. Cling together after the uh, collision. And the loss of energy is its maximum in that case. The loss of energy is maximum in that case. Here's the graph of the coefficient of restitution and their relative velocity of impact velocity. So you see these numbers perfectly elastic, glass on glass, steel on steel, lead on lead, and then perfectly plastic uh, where they stick together down here near zero. Okay. Well, I thought it was. Kind of depends on the steel, probably. I mean, you could get some case hardened kind of conditioned or shot peen type of steel that would behave pretty darn elastically. Yeah. And then, of course, they are, they're dependent on thermal effects as well. Okay. I made a brief comment the other day about uh, energy loss during impact. And the book mentioned that as also. Um, and I didn't explain much in detail about it, but just be aware there's a energy loss always during impact. And the way you'd calculate it, as we've done shown you before, is it's real easy. You just take the kinetic energy in the system before the impact and see what the kinetic energy is right after the impact. And that difference is the energy loss. Right? Okay. Just T after and T before the difference between those will always be negative during impact. The mechanism that's going on during that is uh, there are several things. One is it's almost at a molecular level. There's called an elastic wave. There's, it's, a, it's like a pressure wave that moves through the material, and there's energy loss at the molecular level that occurs during, during that, due to that, during impact. There's also a sound acoustic energy loss. And there's also thermal, where you excite the molecules, and actually some of that's given off to heat, okay, during impact. And can be very significant. So uh, those are all losses that occur, and that's what gives rise to that change in, or that loss in, uh, in kinetic energy in the system. Yeah, question? Well, thinking of those situations in the previous chapter, they're all kind of assuming that it was a, of a, an E of zero, right? Because all the situations... The, the ones you've seen so far? Yeah, all the things are impacting and sticking together. Yes. Especially. And yeah. I was just finding it interesting. So just taking kinetic energy and momentum into account, that calculates out the loss in energy. Well, the, just the change in kinetic energy just, is all. Right, I mean, yeah. ex using the idea of momentum, I mean, that's... Right. Interesting, don't even take into account any of the other things, like right. the yeah. material or... Yeah, totally independent of the material. Alfred? Yeah, so uh, conservation of momentum is completely independent of how much energy is lost, correct? Uh, yes, yes, that's correct. Yeah. Say that one more time, just make sure I'm answering yeah, that right. Conservation of momentum is completely independent of whatever kinds of energy transfers are going on. Correct. And the reason for that, is because these, this force during that contact are equal and opposing one another. 
And then there are these elastic waves that move through that material due to that, due to that shock loading, due to that shock loading. And that's where that energy loss is, it ends up going into the system, into the, into the masses as that wave propagates through there. That's, the, that's related to the stuff I worked on uh, in biomechanics with brain injury, with these pressure waves that move through the brain under impact type of loading conditions. And I don't know if I talked about it, but where the injuries usually occur, subdural hematomas, the rupturing of the vessels, <coughs> contra coup on the opposite side of the impact, oftentimes. You get hit over here, the injuries over there. Okay. And sometimes there's situations where you have multiple impacts going on and or repeated. So that's why once you've had a concussion, once you've had a concussion, it's not a good idea to have multiple concussions because then it, the material in your brain eventually degrades. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's work a uh, let's see. Yeah, let's go ahead and work a problem out. Question about the coefficient of restitution. Yes. Um, how, we, how we define it there? It's the coefficient is equal to the absolute value of the, dif of the difference of, of velocities over each other. Right. Um, all of those velocities vectors. Now, we're taking the absolute magnitude of them. So does that matter? There, it's in a particular, it's in the direction of that. They, they are, have defined directions. So and like I was saying earlier, you have to be careful to write your equations in the particular direction. So the, the coefficient of rest, restitution is directional? Yes. <coughs> well, when we get to oblique central impact, well, let me go ahead and give you a, an idea of where we're going with this. Here's a basketball. Let's say it's traveling this direction. Now it comes down here and it contacts a baseball that is traveling up this way. Now what's going to happen when they meet, when they meet, there is a tangency, and I don't want you to be misled by the lines I've drawn previously. There is a tangency during that contact. And there is a, the force of interaction is going on like that. So you're going to have issues around conservation of momentum in that direction. You're going to have conservation of linear momentum for each mass separately in this direction since there's no forces acting in that direction tangent to the contact surface. So it's very important that if this one was coming in, let's say this one was coming in at this angle. Uh, let me draw it. And keep in mind, we treat these as particles, right? <laughs> okay, we treat them as particles even though I've drawn a massive like this. Let's say this one's coming in with this V1 here, and it then bounces off at this larger angle, V1 prime. This one is coming in, say, like this, V2, at this angle, some theta 2. And this one's coming in at some theta 1. And then this one's going to bounce off maybe at some much smaller angle, something like this. So we have four pieces of information on this oblique central impact stuff that might be available to us. And then we have four things we don't know about. This is theta 2 prime up here. Theta 2, theta 2 prime, theta 1, theta 1 prime. So I'll redraw this when we get to it. But what I wanted to point out to you that 
the problem becomes quite a bit more complex. You now have <coughs> four, four unknowns. So what you have is the coefficient of restitution is, is about the relative velocity of separation and approach in this direction perpendicular to that tangency. So the restitution coefficient it relates to the perpendicular to the tangency. Okay, so it's okay. it's a it is a vector equation, but only relevant along one line, called the transverse axis, transverse to the tangency line. <laughs> now it's much simpler back here, where the transverse line is this way, and we're just dealing with with the restitution, the ability of the masses to recover along that line. Of, uh, of momentum. Okay, let's do a problem. I think we have just enough time to maybe do one of these relatively simple ones here. In the interest of time, I'm going to do, let's do this one. since we only have a few minutes left. We have um, 0.15 meters. We have these uh, two masses. Uh, one's, yeah, we have two masses connected by a massless rod that are originally up here at uh, 0.15 meters above a brass and steel plate. And these are both steel balls up here. And the coefficient of restitution between steel and brass is 0.4. The coefficient of restitution between steel on steel is 0 0.6. 0 0.6. So what we're going to do is we're going to let this horizontal rod drop. And then we want what we're interested in is these are going to whack into the metal plates on the bottom here. And then this rod is going to kick up, isn't this going to kick up over here on the steel more because of it's more elastic than it will on the brass? And so this rod then is going to create some angular velocity. And what we want to do is figure out that angular velocity right after impact. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to go ahead and give you these things. This rod, we have the brass on the left. We have the steel over here. Point 0.15 meters drop. Point 0.15 meters drop. And so what we have is the impact speed as they come down is going to be the speed at impact is going to be equal to the square root of 2gh, which is the square root of 2 times 9.81 times h.15. And so that speed as they come together or hit the plates on the bottom here is 1.716 meters per second. Okay. So now we have a coefficient of restitution that exists over here when that steel ball hits this brass plate. So the steel on brass has a coefficient of restitution of 0.4, and that's equal to the relative velocity of separation. So this ball is going to come down, hit into the brass plate, and bounce back up. So the brass plate's not moving. 
brass, brass plate's not moving, so that this problem is relatively easy. So the velocity of separation is simply the rebound velocity. It, it's this is the velocity of separation, isn't it? It's about that's the, the, the closing velocity. Kind of well, actually, uh, no, actually, huh? Let's see. Isn't that the approach velocity when they come together? Yeah, this is the approach velocity. Thank you. Yeah. So. The velocity of separation then is that. Mm -hmm. And that's divided by 1.716. Now that implies then that the velocity of separation for that ball steel on brass is going to be 0.4 times 1.76. 716. And the value coming off of that is 1.029. The other one, the steel on steel, is, I'm sorry, did I do that wrong? Yeah, I did the math wrong. I wrote down what was wrong here. Um, point, the point 0.4 calculation Steel on brass should be, my final value over here was wrong. Um, 0.686. Thank you, 0.686. The steel on steel has a restitution coefficient of 0.6, and so its velocity of separation, I better use some different symbol there. Call that. I'll call it steel. <laughs> After the impact divided by the incoming is this. So this implies that the velocity of the steel ball is going to be that product 0.6 times that 1.716 or about 1.029. Now you want to be a little careful here because the rebound velocities then are doing this. We have the brass over on our left is heading up with a 0.686 and the other one is heading up with a 1.029. So how, what's the rotational rate of this thing? And it was a 0.6 meter radius here. So isn't the rotation of this rod going to be the difference between these times that lever arm? Yeah, good. So the, uh, the 1.029 minus the 0.686 must be equal to the 0.6 times the omega. Okay, and that yields, that result yields an omega of 0.572 radians per second. Now that's pretty significant. That's more than half a radian per second, more than 30 degrees, more than 30 degrees per second in the rotation right after that impact. And the units on it are counterclockwise, I'm sorry, uh, the Counterclockwise or clockwise? Look at this. Counterclockwise, aren't they? Okay, so that's a pretty practical problem. You could run this experiment and see how close it comes. Okay, that'll do it for today. Have a nice weekend. Thank you.